other day. Okay. When you get an opportunity in this game, you make a play. Go yeah. playmakers on three. One, two, three. Playmakers. Touchdown, Kansas City. The Chiefs are right in the thick of it, baby. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this championship edition, our Super Bowl 57 Volume 1 edition of Defending the Kingdom. Mitch Holtz is with you, voice of the Chiefs, along with the man we call the shop. And uh, he's got, we're going to find out how he's got a hand in both of these deals in Super Bowl 57. And then our senior team reporter, Matt McMullen. All right, let's just start this way and kind of spin around the table about the Chiefs for the third time now in four seasons being in the Super Bowl and winning another Lamar Hunt trophy. Man, I think I talk about it all the time. Anybody who follows me on Twitter or any other social media, the process being more, in product, being more important than the product. It's always about the process. What are we doing each day to build, build, keep building upon what we're doing here in the kingdom and what makes our franchise different, what makes our organization different? Everybody in the building, everybody facing the same direction. You know, everybody on the same page. Coach Andy Reid does an amazing job of giving everybody to see that vision and seeing how we're going to accomplish it, laying out a game plan each day, each game, and understanding how we're going to progress throughout the season to become champions, and now we're here. It's what we talk about in springtime on defending the kingdom and the summer and during training camp and during the regular season through all 18 weeks. And then you see it manifested like this, Matt. And this team, we're going to get into this during this episode, yes. but what this team has done and how they got to this point. Yeah, just how special is this? I mean, three Lamar Hunt trophies, one in our stadium with mm. confetti flying in four years. It's just this isn't supposed to happen the way the NFL is set up. The NFL is built on parity. Everyone's supposed to have a chance. And for the Chiefs to host five consecutive AFC championship games and to win three of them, is truly remarkable and unprecedented, really, in NFL history. The Patriots had a great run, but they didn't host all these games in a row, and the Chiefs have. And this one, for me, I think might be the sweetest so far because 2019 was amazing, but it was kind of like a freight train, right? It's like, oh, we're here. This is amazing. 2020, I think we kind of expected it. 2021, let's go for a three-peat, right? Mm -hmm. And it was taken away from us. So to fight through the entire season and to finish it off against the Bengals of all teams and to go to the Super Bowl here again, uh, this one was the sweetest one, I think, for me. Then you take it back from the one who took it from you. Yes, sir. As you were alluding to, and that made it uh, even better. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. But first, which is defending the kingdom tradition, and now we're meeting kingdom defenders everywhere we go. Yes. Right? They'll come up and mention it. But around the world, who's defending the kingdom in this episode? So we got a hat this hat, of course, for winning the AFC title. I now have 11 hats in my office because seven division title hats, three conference title hats, and a Super Bowl championship hat. Keep Hopefully we get another hat here in a few weeks, Keep but I have 11. Yes, sir. Now, before I jump into the people around the world, we were curious how to say five in Azerbaijani right. uh, last, last time. In last week's episode, and go back and watch it, it was Funf or Cinco, five, for hosting five AFC championship games in a row. And we were curious how you say five in Azerbaijani, because you are quite interested in Azerbaijan. Very much. Uh, the answer is it is pronounced Besh. Besh. And Larry, Besh. James, Joel, and Michael all let us know that. If we ask the kingdom a question, they let us know the answer. The answer <laughs> is Besh. So now we know. Um, now, 11 people around the world listening to DTK. We have Chris in East Ridgeland, South Carolina, otherwise known as Chiefs Kingdom Southeast. Shout out to our fans in the Philippines. I was All called right. out, rightfully so, for this, for kind of glossing over that last time. I'm like, oh, we got a listener in the Philippines, and I just moved on. We care about all of you. Thank yes. you for listening to DTK. Uh, I feel like we have someone in the Philippines every single week. Seems it's remarkable. Like it. The kingdom is well represented in the Philippines. I should not have glossed over it quickly last time. Shout out to all of you. We have Pete from Sydney, Australia. Michael is in Kaiserslautern, Kaiser Slautern, Germany. Kaiserslautern. Yeah, uh, with the wow. U.S. Army. Um, okay. He still finds ways to keep up with the Chiefs every single week, so shout see, out to Michael. See you next fall there, Michael. Yep, that's <laughs> the idea. Uh, we have Tex in Mesa, Arizona. We'll see Tex here pretty soon. Yep. Uh, he grew up in Coffee County, Kansas. Uh, we have a listener in southern Spain, claimed it as Chiefs Kingdom East. Uh, Mar Marina, Mariana, is in Croatia. Uh, Adam is a Volga German, which mm. I did some research on the oh, Volga yeah. Germans. Quite interesting History a big there. part of the history of the Chiefs' kingdom because a lot of Volga German immigrants moved to the kingdom 
and, and a lot of them in Kansas, actually. So made a lot of central Kansas influence among Volga Germans. So. Very cool. Well, Adam is a Volga German. We have a listener in Brighton, United Kingdom. Marios is in Cyprus, claimed it as Chief's Kingdom Island. And then shout out to John from Cody, Wyoming. He lost his mom, Larna Edwards, uh, at the age of 89, two Sundays ago. She was a gigantic Chiefs fan her mm. whole life. Uh, she listened to you call the win over the Jags uh, back in the divisional round yes. and, and passed away the next day, I believe. Mm. Um, but just a huge Chiefs fan. I'm sure she was watching yes. uh, the AFC yes. title game from above. And uh, just sorry, very sorry for your loss, John. But uh, thank you for sharing your story. And this is why Chiefs Kingdom is so great, right? That's it's a right, family. That's right. So uh, 11 today, people listening to DTK. I love the right. fact that you picked 11. Because I think Marquez Valdez Scantling, <laughs> because I think that's yes. his number, right? Marquez yes. Valdez Scantling redefined his career. Really up to this point, and this is not a knock on MVS, but he kind of lived up to the back of his baseball card, meaning, oh, a lot of yards after catch, mm -hmm. right? He'd been the deep threat guy. Go back and watch the 57 yarder against San Francisco. Truthfully, was working on the target to catch ratio, which was about his career. But never, ever, ever, even with his 100-yard receiving game with Green Bay, had he been, you've got to do it, man. It's the Alamo. We're out of ammo. You've got to be the guy. And I thought MVS maybe redefined his career with the performance he had against the Jaguars. I mean, I'm sorry, against the uh, Bengals. Well, when, when all the chips were down, when all the other receivers were coming up a little bit, um, you know, not able to go, it was, it was no one else to turn. It, it was MVS had to be our wide receiver one. The Bengals were going to focus on stopping him, and it was can he win? Can he get away from Eli Apple? Is he going to be able to uh, elude Mike Hilton? Is he going to be able to create the big plays and the big catches? And not only did he create the big plays, but the touchdown scores, the first downs, he brought the energy and the excitement we needed from our wide receivers to make sure that the Cincinnati Bengals could not just focus on taking Kelsey away and then stall our offense. So what he did is when you talk about stepping up to the plate, stepping up uh, your game when most needed, when there was no one else for us to count on, he stepped up in the biggest moment in the biggest time when we needed it to create a future. And, Matt, a lot of his plays in his career up to this point had been scheme plays. Yes. We're going to scheme you into a double move, right? We got you here. We're going to influence him here. Then we're gonna... This was different. He had to make plays where – it wasn't necessarily a scheme for him to be wide open. Mm -hmm. I think of the play where he was double covered and twisted his body uh, over to my left as the Chiefs were going to my left. I go, that's a signature play for him. That and the touchdown. I think we saw a brand-new MVS that sets up possibly the rest of his career. Yeah, it was awesome. He had to be the guy, as Sean mentioned, because no Kadarius Toney in the second half, no McCole Hardman, no Juju Smith-Schuster for much of the second half. And it was really, in a lot of ways, a statement about the Chiefs' season because – in the offseason, mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes talked about how it's going to be everybody. It's going to take everyone. It'll be someone new every single week, right? We're not just going to be an offense that goes through one or two guys. It's going to be an entire team. And that was manifested when you're missing half of your receiver core in the biggest game of the season against a very good defense and the Bengals that have gotten the better of the Chiefs at times, especially in second halves over the last two years. And MVS says, don't worry. Put it on me. I'm here. I'm going to make huge plays in the biggest game of my life. And he did so. He had six receptions for 116 yards in this game and a touchdown. Three of those catches moved the chains on third down, one of them being a huge 19-yard touchdown. Just an amazing performance by MVS in the biggest game of his career. And he was a microcosm of a lot of things that happened. When you think that nine main players were either entering the game injured, some who entered the game injured and were re-injured, Mahomes' ankle, and you think about Kelsey's back, and you think about Nick Bolton and his ankle, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, his toe and his knee, and Kadarius Toney's ankle, and Willie Gay Jr., I mean, just on and on. Guys either hurt during the week trying to gut it out or hurt during the game. So now, Shop, you played this game. Yes. To play this opponent, Cincinnati very good, at this level, and to fight through all of that to win this game, what did that tell you? Man, it just tells me how prepared the coaching staff had our – entire team, not just the ones and twos, but uh, the fourth and fifth wide receiver, the second and third tight end, to be able to go in the game and perform at that level, execute when all the pressure, everything is built up, and in that moment be able to rise to the occasion and make the big first down, make the big blocks. Man, it, it's just, man, you got to tip your hat off to the amount of detail that was paid to this um, Chiefs game plan. And also, it probably caused a little bit of confusion to the to the Bengals' defense because you're expecting to see 87 and 11 out there. You're expecting to see 19 and 17. 
you weren't ready for the other guys that when they showed up. Are we going to tilt the safety to the speed still, or are we going to – uh, are we going to double the second tight end? Or, so it threw a po- probably threw a bunch of their defensive calls a little bit off whack when it came down to it. But, again, hats off to the Chiefs uh, players for definitely stepping up to the moment and playing some unexpected roles in the AFC Championship game. That's why we love you, Shop. That is such an interesting <laughs> perspective. And I actually said something I was thinking about during the game. But then Sky Moore uh, played all three uh, positions uh, with, you know, he's the slot, he's the Z. Um, and became kind of the jet sweep guy. So Sky Moore stepping up. And if you had uh, Marcus Camp catching a pass in the fourth quarter for 13 yards when the Chiefs need it the most, then we'll get you a kingdom Defending the Kingdom T-shirt whenever we get Defending the Kingdom <laughs> T-shirts because you deserve it. But, Matt, it wasn't just on the offensive side. So Legereus Sneed goes down when he's got to leave, and you're facing one of the elite wide receiving cores in the league. Uh, what about the younger guys on that side? Yeah, Joshua Williams steps wow. in. Jalen Watson steps in, and we can talk all about our rookies here. Way back in training camp, Coach Merritt called our rookie defensive backs the Fab Five. (laughs) And those guys were Trent McDuffie, Jalen Watson, Joshua Williams, Brian Cook, and Nazi Johnson. In the biggest game of their lives, here's what those players did. Trent McDuffie had six tackles, a tackle for loss, and two passes defensed. Jalen Watson had four tackles, including one where he kept T. Higgins in bounds mm-hmm. in the closing seconds of the first half that eventually led to the Bengals settling for a field goal. He had two passes defensed. One of those was the very next play on a fade to T. Higgins and an interception. Joshua Williams had four tackles, two passes defensed, an interception. Brian Cook, four tackles, a pass defense that led to Joshua Williams' interception. And then Nazi Johnson had a special teams tackle. The moment was not too big for for these guys against one of the best offenses and one of the best wide receiver cores in the NFL. These DBs, off and on in Island, didn't blink. Yes. It was no problem. And what's so cool about it is if you look back at week 13 against the Bengals, Joshua Williams in particular, there was a few times the Bengals got him. The final play of the game, T. Higgins caught a pass that basically ended the game with Joshua Williams in coverage. They had a chance to make up for all of that in the AFC title game. And those guys all held their own. So really cool stuff from our young DBs. The future is bright in the secondary. And all of you Kingdom defenders around the world, if you get a chance to watch the video of the punt return by Sky Moore, watch who makes the key blocks on that punt return. Many of the names that you mentioned, including Jack Cochran, a uh, undrafted free agent linebacker uh, from the University of South Dakota. But Nazi Johnson was in on that play, too. Uh, so that leads us uh, leads me to the next point I want to get your thoughts on is the fact that the Chiefs played eight rookies on special teams or defense in this game. That tied an all-time NFL record in a championship game, either AFC or NFC, with the 1988 Chicago Bears and the 2013 New England Patriots. Then you throw in the aforementioned Sky Moore and the aforementioned Isaiah Pacheco. Shop, 10 rookies. Yeah. There was like 48 guys that played in this game. Ten of the 48 to win this game were guys that were rookies. Well, I, I'm going to have to – we're going to have to stop calling them rookies. Yeah. Because usually in an NFL career, your first year – when you're a first-year player, you might get 100 snaps. And that's, that's 100 snaps for you to go into offseason and then try to build upon it your second year. These guys have been playing – I mean, they got 100 snaps out of the way by midseason. And so, yes, they're first-year players. And sometimes first-year players, because you don't have enough film on them, it's hard to game plan against. You don't know if inside leverage is truly what you're seeing. You don't know if um, um, a bump and run is not bail technique because you just don't have enough film on these guys to know exactly what you're up against. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, they don't have the experience, but they have so much energy and they, they, they have so much desire to do the right thing. And these guys, when you talk about swagger and confidence, and like you said, Coach Merritt built it in them from the back end down, our rookies, our first-year players, man, they played like savvy vets mm. all game long, and there was not a moment in that game where the moment was too big for them, and they all rose up to the occasion. Yeah, it was, and we saw that even in the summer with these guys, but they just continue to grow, and now they'll be on the biggest stage in Super Bowl 57. But, Matt, before we get into uh, Shop's uh, dichotomy here of his career, I want to ask you about the redemption factor mm. because this script, we've said it before. Yes. Uh, like Ted Lasso's screenwriters are brilliant, right? You're thinking, these are awesome writers. 
They couldn't have thought of this script because in episode low, let's see, four or five, Sky Moore muffs punts and the Chiefs lose to the Colts and muffs a punt against the 49ers and he's a dunce and get him out of here. And then he comes up with that biggest punt return mm. uh, maybe in the Andy Reid era uh, of Chiefs football. And then you get Harrison Butker missing PATs, missing, he's been hurt, and he misses field goals. And he had the one-legged field goal at Arizona, but he missed, oh, my gosh, he's missed. What, what do we got? And then he kicks a kick into the wind that hung up there for years and then drops <laughs> over the crossbar. Those two guys in particular, yes. they could have wilted and melted long ago. It was so awesome. And it's funny you mentioned the script stuff because you and I – talk about the movie draft day a lot and it's one of those things <laughs> my wife's favorite movie i'm like yeah what? like we'll watch it not that good but my wife anyway. will ask me about it like is this kind of how things work behind the scenes i'm like no this is entirely unrealistic and it's ridiculous and everything if the sequence at the end of the afc title game was a movie we would say this isn't realistic because yeah. this would never happen right but that's why after the game when i saw you after we were jumping up and down and screaming for a while i'm like this is why football is the greatest game on earth because sky moore can go through his struggles this season mm -hmm. uh, harrison butker can go through his struggles this season but for each of those guys for the biggest punt return of sky moore's life and the biggest kick of harrison butker's life no problem they're going to come through and how cool is that and that's why if you follow this team the entire season you go through the ups and the downs that's why that moment is so satisfying because Sky Moore's not nervous. He's not going to drop the punt. He's like, I've got this. Not only am I going to catch this, I'm going to run it for 29 yards and get yes. the Chiefs knocking on the door of field goal range. And then when the Chiefs get in Harrison Butker's range on a very cold night where the ball is like a rock, he knocks a 45-yard field goal through the uprights and sends the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. It's just awesome. And it's why we care more about just the team. We care about the players. We That's care right. about them as people yep. and the stories and, and what they've fought through to get here. And for those two guys to come through in the end and to send the Chiefs to the Super Bowl, I listened to a lot of sport talk radio. And before the playoffs started, you kept hearing, oh, man, special teams are going to hold the Chiefs back in the playoffs. Special teams sent the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Just It's so awesome. Yeah, it's so easy to throw shade on guys or certain things during the season. It's such a long uh, twists and turns. But it also tells you about the infrastructure of this Chiefs team and the fact that there is such it's such a great environment because – they stayed with Sky Moore and they stayed Harrison Parker because they knew they could do it. It's interesting. Your old teammate Dante Hall was my Chiefs Kingdom guest yeah. on the radio Monday night. It was awesome. But he's like, he saw Sky Moore. There's nobody left. No. Right? Yeah. All the dudes that did it before were hurt or not active. So he's the only guy left. And so Dante's like, just don't feel it. Just let it bounce. Just let it. And then he saw, oh, it's a returnable punt. And then Dante said, go, go, go. But it was just funny to hear that. All right, let's get – what do you got? But isn't it, how amazing is it from Coach Dave Tobe's point of view? Same thing. People throwing shade on right. Tobe. He's done. It's bet worst Tobe's worst year. Blah, Every blah. other phase, you got first string, second string, string, third string. There's another guy you can put in if somebody's not doing well. Mm -hmm. You don't have a second kicker. You don't have multiple return. Like, you got the guys you got, and you got to make it work. And in the biggest moment, your first returner goes down, McCole Hartman. Your second, Tony, goes down. And now you're dealing with a guy that everybody told you to give up on because during the season, three uh, unfortunate plays uh, kind of took him off the field. No point did Dave Tobe ever lose faith in the kid. He continued to make him go out there and catch punches, catch punts, work on his craft. You never know when we're going to need you. And having that moment arrive, where the confidence and all the faith that Coach Tobe had in this young man, to have it culminate in that point in this moment of the AFC Championship game is going to do amazing things for that young man's career. Oh, and maybe Tommy Townsend did okay holding the ball. <laughs> hmm. What about Holdergate? Storylines. That was uh, Ted Lasso, episode 12, Holdergate. Uh, and the fact that we overlook what Tommy Townsend's meant to this team in net punting because the Chiefs, oh, they're going to decide the punt when it's 20 to 20. Burrow's going to get the ball back. Oh, look where he got the ball mm, back. Yes, right. Okay, and Tommy Townsend's done that all year long. Easy to take that for granted. Okay. We're going to close it out this way on our Super Bowl 57 edition part one. We're going to get into the weeds of the game a lot more next week in the Phoenix area. With uh, Actually, we're going to have a couple of DTKs for you. But we've got to talk about how intriguing this specific Super Bowl is. And in many ways, more than any of the 56 preceding Super Bowls because of all of the ties. Starting 
with our own shop, our own <laughs> Spider-Man. Let's go. Let's see it. Full disclosure, what do we got? Well, everybody talks about is it the Andy Bowl, is it the Kelsey Bowl, right? Andy having <laughs> ties to Philadelphia and Kansas City, both Kelsey, right? Jason and Travis. His mom has the half jersey, uh-huh. right? 87 on one, 62 on the back. Who is she going to cheer for? Well, in my own house, when I look through the closet, of course everybody knows that barbershop jersey. But be- before I was ever a chief. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. For those of you listening and not watching, it's a Philadelphia Eagle Sean Man. Barber 5'6 jersey. I was I – mean, listen, that 2002 year, I was uh, probably an alternate for the Pro Bowl. I had over 100 tackles, big play – I mean, Jim Johnson, God bless his soul. You talk about a guy that was out there just playing with his hair on fire. <laughs> I was the wheel linebacker. I was all over that freaking field. Me and Brian Dawkins <laughs> were like Batman and Robin that season. Man, I mean, this jersey right here, it's a game-worn jersey. It means so much to me. But when I got to the kingdom and I decided to trade in the the, the emerald and green or emerald and black for the uh, uh, Chiefs colors, man, this, this yeah, that's right. Throw that one away. <laughs> this is the one, all right, when it's time for me to be laid to, 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 to rest, this is the one you need to put on my tombstone right here, man. 59, barbershop, this is the one I'm going with, man, so. Uh, shout out to the Chiefs Kingdom. But there's been other players, right? We talked about uh, Jeremy Macklin. We talked oh, about man. Shady McCoy. Um, Jason uh, Avant. Jason Avant, an awesome faith-driven guy. Uh, won, uh, such a solid special teams for not only the Eagles but for Kansas City. And then a litany. Stephen Wisniewski wins a Super Bowl with both teams. Players. And then a, a, just a laundry list of coaches mm. that came from that Philadelphia Northeast Corridor and made their way to the Midwest. Uh, it's so many different uh, uh, connection points between – Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles, um, but I think it begins and starts starts and stops with Coach Andy Reid mm. and the uh, the amount of man just the faith driven uh, family football and faith and the way he leads this organization um, is one for the ages, man. So, yeah, and man, I get your closing thoughts on this, but really the infrastructure and the guts of this ten year run in the Chiefs Kingdom, which has been unprecedented in franchise history, and in some ways. And closing out in many ways, unprecedented in National Football League history. It's yes. I mean, it's there to you. We'll get into this more next week in Phoenix. Mark Donovan, president of the Chiefs, was with the Eagles. You mentioned Coach Reed, fourteen seasons with the Eagles. Brett Veach was with the Eagles. Um, Coach Melvin was with the Eagles. G. Lou played for the Eagles. Coach with the Eagles. Um, we go right down the line here. Mike Frazier, Spagnola, Spag, I mean, all these guys. There is. The 2013 to 2022 Kansas City Chiefs were really a byproduct, a strong byproduct of those 14 years of Andy Reid in Philadelphia. Yeah, 100%. And the culture is something that I think is very similar yes. in both places. And you can look at the, the story of both seasons for these teams, and you can see that culture at work. Both those teams stuck with what they knew. We know the culture that we have here. We know the players that we have here. We're going to trust our guys. And both teams are 14-3 and three and clashing in the Super Bowl. And that culture is something that makes these teams both so great. And it's no accident. It's something that takes years and years to cultivate. And we're so fortunate to have that culture here. If you lined up engineers, we have so many awesome engineers in the Chiefs Kingdom and now around the world that are Chiefs fans and part of the Chiefs Kingdom. If you had engineers and architects that were together on a project and just laid out blueprints and designs on a table, and they'll say those designs were for the 2013 to 2022 Kansas City Chiefs, some third-party observer would go, well, wait a minute. Wasn't that the 1999 to 2012 Philadelphia Eagles? And the answer would be yes. He's Sean Barber. He's Matt McMullen. I'm Mitch Holtis, voice of the Chiefs. We're headed to Phoenix, and we will have more Defending the Kingdom for you next week. In fact, two episodes will jump more into Super Bowl 57. Until then, enjoy the ride, everybody, and get ready to win another championship. Ten, five, touchdown! Lock it down! And the celebration begins at Arrowhead.